morning, everybody. Good to uh, good to see everybody, and uh, good to hear the excitement and the buzz, and and uh, enjoying each other's company and uh, welcoming each other. It's all good stuff. We uh, look forward to our worship today. Um, we welcome each of you here. We welcome those visiting with us uh, as well. Also, we uh, are glad to have those on Facebook watching us and praying with us as, and uh, worshiping with us as well. Uh, our services do consist of uh, praise time and, and hearing the Lord's word proclaimed and God's word proclaimed. And also we do partake uh, each Sunday in the Lord's communion. Uh, and uh, if you want to partake with us, the emblems are on the table there in front of the sound room. Uh, so we want to make, uh, make it known that the emblems are there if you uh, want to partake communion with us at the end of our service today. Just a couple announcements. Uh, as we mentioned last week, we are marching in the Memorial Day Parade in Alger, and we are ordering uh, new shirts for this year. The orders need to be turned in next Sunday, and there's order forms on the uh, Welcome Center if you'd like to uh, order a shirt for, next, for the parade this year. Also, uh, Camp Christian, uh, getting ready to uh, start with summer camp for our youth. And uh, the church will be uh, contributing uh, up to $125 or 50% or of the cost, up to $125. Uh, the church will take care of, and then the parents uh, or the youth uh, can take care of the, the balance. We also have some scholarship fund available for that as well. So if you have a youth or some friends of your youth that uh, just don't have the funds, we do have a scholarship fund that's been established for several years where money was given anonymously uh, just for that purpose, to make sure if there's a young person that wants to go to camp, uh, the funds are available to, to get them there. So keep that in mind. Lastly, uh, we made our third payment to Ukraine. The third payment was mostly donated money from, from you, the congregation, the body of believers here at McGuffey, and we have more donations being made, so we'll be making a fourth uh, or payment to Ukraine for the work that's being done over there uh, by, the, by the gentlemen that we're connected with through the uh, Christian University over there. Any other announcements before we move to our prayer time? Okay. If not, uh, uh, Dan and Lisa Ralston were both added to the prayer list just to have some health issues that we need to be praying about for them. Uh, Patty Mantel, have we got an update on Patty? Is she? Okay. 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 Let's continue to pray for Charlie and Patty. They are home, and, uh, but continue to pray for them and their prayer concerns. Of course, a couple of families to keep in prayer. Uh, Parkins family that lost uh, Peggy Ann uh, Parkins and Jeffrey Parkins to a house fire, I think, a week ago uh, yesterday. So be in prayer for the Parkins family. Also, the Marvin Ford family as uh, Marvin passed away Friday afternoon. So anybody else we need to mention before we uh, begin our time in worship? Okay. If not, you want to stand, Ray? Okay. <laughs> Please stand with me and I'll open us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful uh, to have the opportunity to just come and, and uh, just for one thing, just to, just to truly give you all the praise and all the glory. We have so much to be grateful for and thankful for. You created us uh, by knowing that Lord is our, Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He gives our life purpose. Uh, uh, we, don't, we, need, we can resist all the things that the world throws to us, worry. Uh, complaining just it just doesn't need to be because we can have knowing Christ is in charge we have peace and can have some understanding and and just enjoy life we know times come that are tough but we know that uh, father if we continue to love you that uh, good will come from it father we just uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to use our voices this morning we just uh, pray that we put a smile on our face and and just truly uh, truly sincerely worship you this morning through our song of praise and and we're excited about hearing more of your word proclaimed to us that we can continue to study it and, and just retain it and, and uh, just make some sense out of our daily lives. Lastly, Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ. Uh, it's that blood that uh, just washes our sins away if we'll accept that blood, accept that sacrifice, accept that amazing grace. And uh, then we have hope for that eternal life with you, and we look forward to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wait. 
praise him. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, and I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been
Usually people are screaming when I'm about an hour and a half into my sermon and they want me to get out of here. <laughs> Good morning, church. It's great to see so many of you here this morning. We're uh, real excited about some things we've got going on here today, and you'll get to be part of that here in a little bit, but uh, really excited. Um, Teresa Harden had asked me to mention to you folks, too, a friend of hers lives in Roundhead. His name is Dana Hughes, and Dana has COVID, and he is uh, on a ventilator at this time, and, and, but he's on a ventilator. And uh, she asked that you pray for him, if you, if you would, please. So I'm glad that uh, you're all here. I was reading where a, uh, a New York City family, they bought a ranch out west where they intended to raise cattle. And friends visited and asked if the ranch had a name. Well said the would-be rancher. He said, I wanted to name it the Bar J Ranch. My wife wanted to name it the Susie Q Ranch. One son liked the Flying W Ranch. And the other one's Lazy Y Ranch. So we're calling it the Bar J Suzy Q Flying W Lazy Y Ranch. And the guy says, okay, but where are all your cattle that you're going to raise? And he looks at his friend and he said, not one of them survived the branding. <laughs> Some churches are like that. They try to incorporate ideas from various people. And then they wonder why that fails. According to the January 2022 edition of Christianity Today magazine, said that the COVID pandemic has reduced the number of regular churchgoers in America from 34% of the population in 2019 to 28% of the population. But that only accelerated the decline which has been going on in our churches for over two decades. We've seen a decline in our own church here ourselves at times. So with everything going on in this world, we must ask ourselves this question this morning. How do we rebuild the church? How do we build the church here in McGuffey, Ohio? How do we establish or reestablish a lasting, vibrant ministry that makes a difference for eternity? How about we pray about that? Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, the beautiful sunshine, Lord. We thank you for so many people being here today. It's just a blessing to see people who have put you first in their life, Lord God. We thank you for our friends watching on Facebook Live and the time they take to watch us. And Father, we thank you just for giving us a voice 
a, vo a voice to be heard and to proclaim your goodness, to proclaim your grace and give you the glory, to give you the praise on everything we do. Father, we're moving forward in this community and because of you, we're making waves and we're making positive things go on in our community, Lord God. Protect us when we do that work. Watch over us, Lord God. Be with us. Help us not to get tired. Help us not to get deterred. Help us to go forward with our gifts that you've given us. Help us to teach people about Jesus Christ. Father, watch over us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for speaking through me in spite of my failures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the island of Kos, the home of Hippocrates, the great physician from whom we get the Hi Hippocratic Oath, there's a tree that grows there that says Hippocrates himself once gathered his students for class under this tree. And this tree is only about 500 years old. It is purported that this tree is a shoot of the original tree. Now additional legends places the Apostle Paul as once teaching under this same tree. Now even if the tree is not fully original, the site it marks is. 500 years ago is quite an accomplishment for a tree. However, such a great span of time has seen curious developments. Close examination shows that although the tree has every appearance of a regular tree from one side from the other, it is plain that the tree is fully hollow. It's completely hollow. In fact, the trunk consists of only a semicircular ring of about six inches or so of actual tree with bark both inside and outside. The ornate metal railing around the trees are in fact supporting some of the branches as there's not enough left of the trunk, or probably the roots either, to support so much weight. Still, year after year, the tree somehow almost inconceivably manages to sprout a few leaves and fruits. And tourists gather to the tree mainly because of the legend of Hippocrates and, and the Apostle Paul. But some probably visit just to see an old tree. How often do you get to see a tree still plugging away after half of a millennium? You don't because this tree should have succumbed to natural order years ago. And this tree long ago ceased to be able to support itself. Because of its fame, this tree has been carefully preserved at great expense. And no one goes through this kind of inconvenience for a regular tree. If you want shade, this one should have been removed. Younger trees are hardier and more productive and far less expensive to maintain. Why do I tell you about a tree? Because the same can be said about the church. Some churches exist as a tourist attraction. Only because of fame and legend and reputation are they still propped up and preserved no matter what the cost. They cease to produce a profitable harvest year after year. Now they still sprout the occasional leaf or fruit or each time they do, people gather and marvel at the life that still resides there year after year. But meanwhile, down the road, down the road there's a healthy, vibrant church with minimal effort and investment produces maximum harvest. But that is where the analogy between the church and the tree of Hippocrates ends, you see. It's not necessarily age that defines churches being alive. It is the spiritual foundation of the church. Even at 500 years of age, the tree of Hippocrates could be, be very productive with a strong root system and foundation. And very young churches can easily get to the point where it ceases to make sense to preserve them. Very old churches can be vibrant and productive. Any church that has begun to question its vitality and viability should know that rejuvenation starts with the roots, reestablished on the solid rock, and that church will return. Do you believe that today? Several years ago, I was out in California for a conference, and I wanted to see, I had a day off, and there's two churches out there I wanted to see. One was uh, Saddleback Community Church I wanted to see. The other was um, Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral. Some of you may not be too young to understand know about the Crystal Cathedral. But I went to the Crystal Cathedral and I walked up there and I asked, there was a fellow standing there at the door and I said, I'd like to come in and look at your church. He says, okay. So I walk in the door and there's tape. That's the only place I could, this is a massive church. Thousands of people go there and I could just look in there because they didn't want people to mess up their church. I leave there. I go to Saddleback Community Church. I get on the property First person I see is the gardener. I said, hey, Rick Warren wouldn't have to be around, would he? We're old friends. Um, but uh, he said, no, he's out, he's uh, you know, doing some conferences. I said, can I look around? He said, 
You can look at any building you want. You can walk anywhere on this property you want. This is God's property, not ours. Which church do you think is healthier? Which church do you think is healthier? If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 3 this morning. First Corinthians chapter 3, and we are going to be where the Apostle Paul shares how he built the church in Corinth in a culture much like ours today. Now we're going to be in First Corinthians, we were there two weeks ago, and then we had Mother's Day last week, and we're starting a sermon series today on First Corinthians. And then in Corinth, this church, lots of churches, most of the churches in Corinth at this time are made up of the Gentiles. Unfortunately, going on here, this is a cosmopolitan city, lots of trading going on in Corinth, very, but they start going the wrong way. The churches start getting infiltrated with the wrong uh, message, and, and Paul is trying to get this taken care of. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 and 11. God's word says this, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one could lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Friends, if we want to build a lasting, vibrant ministry here in McGuffey, we want to rebuild, we need to start with the right foundation. We need to start with the right foundation. We need to begin with Jesus Christ, establish the church on the Lord, not on personalities, not on programs, and not on policies. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. He described himself as a master builder, kind of like an architect who laid the only foundation that would last. And when Paul planted the church in Corinth, he began with a focus on Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 2, verse 2. It says, Paul said, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is his focal point. Okay? Now, every architect knows that the foundation of a building is crucial. Okay? And that's because the foundation determines the size, the shape, and the strength of the structure itself. A few years ago, I was in San Francisco for a conference, and I had an opportunity to go over the Golden Gate Bridge a few times. Really a beautiful sight, if you ever get a chance to see that. But I found out a fact that I did not know about the Golden Gate Bridge. I found out that the safest place to be during an earthquake is the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge. Experts say that it will withstand an earthquake of 9.0 on a Richter scale. That's because, number one, it's flexible. It's flexible. Number two, every piece of metal, every piece of concrete and pavement, all of it relates one piece to another to two giant cables that come up to the two great piers that go into the bedrock, which make the foundation. While flexible, everything connects to an unmovable foundation, which cannot fail. In the same way, if we want to build a lasting, vibrant ministry, we must build it on the bedrock of Jesus Christ. We must be the foundation, and that must be our focus in all we do. Now, flexibility is an important time, an important part of it, and times change, and God provides different opportunities for ministry. For example, the COVID epidemic has moved us into an online live stream ministry that none of us foresaw two and a half years ago. But with all these new programs, Jesus has remained the foundation and focal point of all the ministries here at McGuffey. And I'm so proud of you for doing that. Now, while some methods have changed, the message has always remained the same here. We preach Christ crucified and risen again. It's the bedrock of this church. In 1912, a medical missionary, Dr. William Leslie, went to live and minister to tribal people in a remote corner of the Dominican Republic of the Congo. And after 17 years, Dr. Leslie returned to the U.S., a discouraged man. Now, believing he had failed to make an impact for Christ, he died nine years after his return. But in 2010, a team led by Eric Ramsey and Tom Cox, World Ministries, they made a, a very surprising discovery. They found a network of reproducing churches hidden like glittering diamonds in the dense jungle across the Kualu River where Dr. Leslie had lived and ministered. And based on this research, Ramsey thought that Yancey in this remote area might have some exposure to the name of Jesus, but no real understanding of who he is. He didn't think anything existed. And they were unprepared for their find. 
He said, when we got in there, we found a network of churches throughout the jungle. Each village had its own gospel choir, although they wouldn't call it that. They wrote their own, own songs, and they would have sing-offs from church to church. And they found a church in each of these eight villages that visitors scattered across 34 miles. And they also found a thousand-seat stone cathedral. And many people walk miles to attend these churches. And a church planning movement has begun in the Congo. What are we doing here? Apparently, Dr. Leslie has traveled throughout this remote region, teaching the Bible and promoting literacy. And for 17 years, he fought tropical illness, charging buffaloes, armies of ants, and leopard-infested jungles to bring the gospel into a remote area. And he died feeling like he had failed, but instead, his faithfulness and courage left a powerful legacy of vital churches in that area. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He uses us to build his churches against which even the gates of hell cannot prevail. Much less illness, animals, armies of ants and roaming leopards. If we establish our church on Christ, we will prevail no matter the hardship, COVID or otherwise. Do you believe that this morning? If we want to build a lasting, vibrant ministry, we start with the right foundation. And number two, we put a quality structure on that foundation. We put a quality structure on that foundation. It wouldn't do us any good to put a shack on a foundation equipped for a skyscraper, would it? No, if we want to build a church to last, we must add the foundation of Christ's fully devoted followers. We must build a, scripture, a structure on Christ which is made up of quality, first-rate disciples of Christ. And that's what we're striving to do here. Equip you all for ministry. Look at these words from 1 Corinthians 3, 12 and 13 says, If anyone builds on this foundation using gold and silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Now we know there's nothing better than a fire to show the quality of material used in building. Wood, hay, and straw burn quickly. But gold, silver, and jewels will survive any fire. Now, a lot of people use these verses to talk about what individual Christians build into their personal lives. But the context is talking about people who build churches. And if we build the church with shallow Christians, it's not going to last. But if we build the church with fully devoted followers of Christ, then it will survive any crisis. It will not only survive, friends, it will thrive. And you can be a part of that. In late February 2022, right after the Russian forces began their invasion into Ukraine, you, <coughs> Rachinets was the Deputy uh, General Secretary of Ukraine's Bible Society. And he said, as, oft, as is often the case in changing times, people in Ukraine are more open to the gospel than ever before. Churches are filled with people wanting to pray, receive comfort, and find community. He said, in our churches, whether it's an Orthodox church, a Catholic church, a Protestant church, or an Evangelical church, there are more now people, not only on Sundays or Saturdays, but also during the week. He said, on evenings when we have a Bible study, new people are coming every week, and they want to pray. They want to hear something that brings hope or comfort. And Christians from different denominations have united together for prayer. They've gathering in some of the city's largest cathedrals. And an evangelical service in February of this year in the Ukraine drew more than 1,000 attendees and 45,000 who watched on YouTube. That's in a war-torn country. What are we doing here? Since then, more than 4 million Ukrainians have fled the country, and another 7 million have been internally displaced. But many believers have chosen to stay and minister to the millions of refugees pouring out throughout their communities. It's incredible. Now, such work isn't for new believers. 
Evangelicals were among those active in helping Ukraine displace after Russia's invasion in the East in 2014, so they knew what they were getting into. And that experience from back then helped mobilize Christians to assist again, even as the number of displaced Ukrainians swelled to over 11 million people. In March of 2002, Alexander Bochneko, he returned to the seaside city of Odessa after evacuating his family and continued serving in his church's disaster center. In February, he said they were planning the June wedding of their daughter. Before she left, his wife whispered quietly. She said, may this be forever? And Alexander said, I smiled at her comfortably, but my soul burst into tears. And Christianity Today reports his work is not in vain. Ukrainian sources are all clinging to God, and the damage has not deterred them from winning this fight. You see, friend, hope and faith in Christ. That's exactly what God will do. He will let us win. He will let this place grow strong, not us. He will add to the numbers daily those being saved. He will add to the numbers daily those being saved. And friends, if God's church is going to survive and thrive, then it must be made of fully devoted followers of Christ, just like these friends in Ukraine. And Bill Self put it well when he said to a group of church leaders, somehow we have to make disciples instead of inspirational junkies. We have to make us disciples. And the church that equips people to follow Christ will last a whole lot longer than a church which just makes people feel good. Let's look at verses uh, 14 and 15 again from 1 Corinthians 3. It says, If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I want what I do for Christ to count for eternity. I don't want to come to the end of my ministry and have nothing to show Jesus. Leroy Imes, the man who wrote a classic work on making disciples, wrote a book. He tells about a, visiting a foreign mission field and, and, and talking with veteran missionary people. And he told a story that still haunts him. Leroy Imes said, I can't get it out of my head. This man had gone overseas for 15 years before he met, and he began his program And about the time he arrived on the missionary field, he met a young man named Johnny who was involved in something quite different. Johnny was a committed disciple of Jesus Christ, but he was going about it, his ministry all the wrong ways, according to the book. In contrast to the typical missionary approach, Johnny was spending the bulk of his time meeting with a few young men in that country. The veteran missionary tried to get Johnny straightened out, but the young men kept on with his different approach. Years passed. And the veteran missionary now had to leave the country of his service due to new restrictions. And as he sat across the coffee table for me in his home, he told me, Leroy, I've got a little to show for you. I've got little to show for my time here. And he said, oh, there's a group of people who meet in our assembly, but I wonder what will happen to them when I leave. They're not disciples, Leroy. They've been faithful in listening to your sermons, but they do not witness. And few of them know how to lead one another person to Jesus Christ. They know nothing about discipling others. He says, and now that I'm leaving, I can see I've all but wasted my time here. And then I look at what has come out of Johnny's life, he says. One of the men he worked with is now a professor at the university. And this man is mightily used by God to reach and train scores of university students. Another one of these young men leading a witnessing and discipling team of about 40 young men and women. Another is in a nearby city with a group of 35 growing disciples around him. Three have gone to other countries as missionaries and are now leading teams who are multiplying disciples. And God is blessing their work. I see the contrast between my life and Johnny's, he says, and it's tragic. He said, I was sure I was right of what I was doing, but I was just preaching. And Johnny was evangelizing. Can we do that here? You see, we don't get lasting results by filling pews. We get lasting results by making disciples. 
So if we want to build a church that lasts, we must start with the right foundation. We must put a quality structure on the foundation, be devoted followers of Christ, and we must maintain the church. Look at these words from 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. These Corinthian Christians were at each other's throats. They were fighting each other. And as a result, they were in danger of destroying each other. They were in danger of destroying God's temple, which is what they were. God's people gathered together in local churches are God's holy temple. And woe to the one who desecrates the temple. Woe to the one who vandalizes it. If you ruin God's church with division and dissension, God will ruin you. Daniel Overdorf, a professor of pastoral ministry at Johnson University, told the following story. He said, a few years ago, I visited a couple in their home. And both husband and wife had lived most of their lives apart from Christ and his church. Their marriage, a second marriage for both, had grown really rocky. The 50-year-old husband faced a frightening battle with cancer, and neither partner was handling it very well. And their desperation led them to consider their spiritual needs. And a friend invited them to the church, and they came. The first Sunday they arrived late, they sat in the back pew, then bolted for the door before the closing song ended. As weeks passed, however, they moved to the middle of the auditorium room and stayed after the service was over to mingle. And after a few casual conversations about the weather, the work, and local sports team, I asked if I might visit them to talk further about their faith. And reluctantly, they responded, yes, we would like very much to have that conversation. He said, I sat in their living room, drank sweet tea, and attempted to make them comfortable with more talk of weather and baseball. And after 20 minutes and a refill of tea, I steered the conversations towards spiritual matters. We've enjoyed everything. <clears throat> We've enjoyed having you at church. Is there anything about Christianity or Jesus or the church that I can help you understand? And the husband responded with carefully measured words. He said these words. He says, Jesus is attractive to me, but I struggle with the church. My grandmother sometimes dragged me to church when I was a kid, and what I remember most are the arguments I hear in the parking lots and the hallways. One person didn't like the preacher, another defended the preacher, another piped with suspicion about the church treasure. It was the same argument over and over every Sunday. The wife sitting there nodded her head to her husband's words. He said, even today, I drive down the street near our house, I come to 10 different churches with 10 different names on the signs. And the people in those churches barely talk to each other. People all around them are dying and going to hell, or so they say they believe, but they spend all their time arguing. He then dropped the generic they and challenged me with many questions along those lines. Not letting me speak, he finished with this question. He says these words, Why should I believe what you're saying? when you guys can't agree on what you're telling me. And the room went silent. I stared at my tea and I shifted in my seat. I stammered through an answer that did not satisfy me any more than it satisfied him. And thankfully, this couple continued working through these questions and meeting with the minister. And we celebrated their baptism into Christ a year later. But how many remain separate from Christ and his church because they have similar concerns? I've seen it happen, friends, with several troublemakers in the church over the years. They demanded their own way, and if they didn't get it, they'd spread dissension. Then later, sometimes years later, the families fell apart, they lost their jobs, or they faced financial ruin. In every case, they became the most unhappy people I've ever met. So friends, what I'm telling you this morning is, we need to keep dissension away from this body of believers. We need to maintain the church with godly wisdom. We need to run God's church God's way and not ours. Look at verses 18 through 20. Do not deceive yourself. 
If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. You see, the world's wisdom is fruitless. It's void of any results. It has no lasting value. I like the way Warren Worsby put it when he says, you cannot manage a local church the same way you run a business. This does not mean we should not follow good business principles. But the operation is totally different. There is a wisdom of this world that works for the world, but it will not work for the church. We have to be different. Do you believe that? We have to be different, friends. The world depends on promotion, prestige, and the influence of money and important people. The church depends on prayer, the power of the Spirit, humility, sacrifice, and service. And the church that imitates the world may seem to succeed in time, but it will turn to ashes in eternity. I promise you that. I promise you that. We must manage the church God's way and not our way. We must seek His mind in prayer and depend on His Spirit. You see, the world says stand up for your rights. Get all that you can. God says give up your rights. Humble yourself and give yourself as sacrificial service. And when we do church God's way, we shine. Look at verses 21 through 23. So then, no more bloating, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Caiaphas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Now here's the tough part. You may have a personal preference when it comes to a particular leader, leader, but don't permit your personal preferences to become a divisive prejudice. The fact is, sometimes, friend, the leader you enjoy the least may be the one you need the most. And God has given all his servants to the church, and we all have different gifts. We all have different strengths and weaknesses, but they are all God's gifts to the church, and we must learn to appreciate each one. Retired basketball player A.C. Green talked about his glory years in high school. He said, at Benson High School in Portland, Oregon, I was a sports-minded, egotistic maniac. I was the tallest guy on the team and could have broken every scoring record, but my coach wouldn't let me. Even with, with the brakes on, twice one year he scored 39 points, and in the season final he scored 40 points, and Green averaged 27 points a game, but as a team, they scored more than 100 points in seven games and averaged over 90 points the entire season. Green was voted the Oregon 1981 Player of the Year. And he says these words. He says, Coach Gray wouldn't allow me to be a hot shot scorer because he was more interested in the final stat of the team being number one. And he knew the only way we could reach that championship level was for us to become team players. And he says in Basketball and Life, Everyone starts out with what's in it for me attitude. What's in it for me? You see, everybody on the team has a role to play. And we're all equal. I read about a church who years ago bickered over the use of a piano. Some wanted to use the piano during some Sunday worship and others did not. And the disagreement grew sharp, and the church divided into two sides over the issue. On Sunday, when members arrived for church, they discovered a new piano on stage. And to the horror of the half, the congregation, someone played the piano during the service. And the furious members marched out of the building in protest. And the following Sunday, everyone returned to church, but the piano no longer sat on the stage. And those who brought the instrument could not find it and immediately pointed fingers towards those who did not want the piano. And for months the piano remained lost and accusations flew and tempers flared and six months later someone finally found the missing piano. You know where they found it? They found it in the baptistry. Because the baptistry hadn't been used in six months. And when a church fights, friends, baptistries remain unused. 
God calls us to enter our, into community, which means he wants us to be engaged in others' lives and experiences. You see what it is, friends. It's showing up at the funeral. It's holding a hand at the funeral. It's taking time to visit at the hospital. It's making a point to go to the concert. And the lesson here teaches that we are and should be affected by each other's experiences, which leads us to respond so that we can sympathize, offer to assist, or do what we can humanly to alleviate people's suffering. We each have a unique ability to offer as ministers to God's church. Do you believe that this morning? I want to close my message this morning. I want to close my message with this story. And it's about a couple young people. Anila and Praveen are their name. Anila and Praveen. And they're 17 and 8-year-old Pakistani children. And Anila met Praveen at school. And as their friendship grew, Anelia gave Praveen a Bible and taught her Christian songs. And Praveen quickly learned Christian songs and began to teach them to her younger sister when her parents weren't home. And Praveen's parents soon learned of the songs. And being strict Muslims, they were not happy about this. But rather than confronting Praveen right away, they had her younger sister try to find out where she was getting this Christian influence. And Anelia eventually invited Praveen to a Good Friday service. And when the young Muslim heard the gospel presentation, she immediately accepted Christ and was baptized. Praveen became very excited about her new relationship with Jesus. And she saw great changes take place in her life. She read her Bible and praised God boldly. And Anila knew that before long her friend would encounter opposition from her Muslim family. She didn't care. She'd fallen in love with Jesus. Praveen's parents were furious when they learned of her conversion. They had previously arranged for her to marry a Muslim man. And when Praveen refused, she ran away. And when Praveen's family could not find her, they accused Anelia and her minister of kidnapping her. And they had Anelia arrested. And Anelia was slapped and beaten in front of her parents for over nine hours. And she was taken to prison. Anelia's minister and her family were also taken to prison on the following day. And Anelia and the minister experienced horrible torture in jail. They were whipped numerous times. And when they were released, Anelia could not sit for two months, and her minister could barely walk from the bruises on her hips and thighs. But Praveen was later found by her family. To restore the honor of her family, Praveen's brother stabbed her to death. He then turned himself into the local authorities, as is not uncommon in such Muslim areas. And he was eventually released without incident because of a justified killing of a Christian. Anelia was then arrested on charges of kidnapping. She was in prison and then released on bail a little more than a month ago. And she and her family went into hiding as their lives were threatened by radical Muslims. And in May 1999, Anelia was acquitted of all charges. Praise God for the prayers of faithful believers around the world. And people continue to pray for her protection as she remains in hiding in this day. I have seen the world, Anelia says, and it has nothing good. Jesus is my only peace. Friends, I want you to remember something this morning about the church of Jesus Christ. Remember, friends, Jesus said this would happen. He said in Matthew 10, brothers will betray brothers to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's a promise from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can have that promise this morning. Come down front, receive Jesus as Lord of your life, ask Him into your heart. You've heard the message. Have your sins washed away today in the waters of baptism. But there's one condition here at this church if you're new. Come today. Come just as you are.
congregation have a seat, please. This is a good day. This is a good day. This is Sarah and Quentin Schmidt. They've been coming to this church for a couple years now. They're an integral part of what we do here. Sarah and Quentin do our field trips for our youth because nobody else is crazy enough to do that. And they have a big car. No, they're wonderful people and their children are wonderful people. And today, because you have entrusted your children with them, Sarah's going to tell you about this family. It's a different family. But because of love and Jesus Christ, this family has now become whole. And Quentin and the boys told me Thursday we met, they want to give wholeheartedly their life to Jesus Christ and have their sins washed in baptism today. So we're going to do three baptisms today. You can clap. That's great. We don't, we don't always have to be somber and relevant, okay? We don't even have to be somber and tired here, okay? So what we're going to do is, I'm going to take their confession of faith, and while we're getting ready in the back room, Sarah's going to share her story for family and what Jesus has done for them. So if I get you boys to stand up here, and I'll ask you to repeat after me that confession that Peter gave. I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God. I accept Him as my Lord and Savior. I will repent of my sins. And I will follow Him the rest of my days through life. And all God's people said, Amen. So, come on, fellas, go back in here. Or you guys can actually go over there, won't you, Quentin? Yeah, I'm going to take this off so I don't get electrocuted. Good morning. Um, I'm not a public speaker, and I'm definitely emotional. <laughs> but um, we were married um, and had infertility issues, and we were going through all that stuff with the doctor. And I just had this feeling come over me. I didn't want to do that anymore. I said, "Quit." I'm sorry, but I just feel like foster care, maybe adoption, would be for us. <laughs> While we were fishing one day, and he would, said, I could not do a, do a foster care. I couldn't love a kid and give him back to a questionable situation. And the um, very next week, I got home from work. I honestly thought <laughs> I didn't, someone had died because Quentin was white as a ghost. And he was like, we have to talk. And I thought, okay. And he opened this conversation with, you can leave this marriage as you, if you want to. Um, and of course, my mind was blown. I was like, what is happening? We've only been married like 10 months. And uh, he said, I got a letter in the mail today. I may have a four-year-old son. And that was a relief. I thought, OK, a kid, I can deal with that. God had already worked on my heart to be open to another child. And through a process, he was found to be the father of Braden. And, um, we found out Braden was in Wisconsin at the time with a family member. They, he um, and Isaiah both were in a house fire. Their mom had set fire to the house they were in. And she ended up in prison. And then they were sent to their grandparents. And we honestly don't know what they went through there. I can only imagine. But they were removed from there for neglect and abuse. And um, then they were placed in foster care. And that family decided to stop fostering. And then they went with this relative of their mother's. And she moved to Wisconsin. And that's when the mother decided to let both Quentin and Isaiah's father know that they had children through the state. And uh, so we decided to go ahead and go looking for Braden. That was a complicated process. But in that time, we figured, found out about Isaiah and asked the guardian if at Lida, could we have them both because we would be their fifth home and that was the only constant either of them ever had and fortunately Isaiah's father was very supportive 
He said, I don't really live a life for a little kid. And if you can raise him with his brother who he knows and in a family lifestyle, that's what every kid deserves. So that was a blessing. We got to keep both boys. Bring them home. We didn't know that, I don't know, we were both raised in relatively stable homes. So you don't realize what all struggles it is for a traumatized child. But um, they've been through a lot. Isaiah was unable to speak, wasn't potty trained, nothing. He was three and a half, almost four years old. And then Braden was just full of anger and he would run away from home, went through periods of wanting to commit suicide, um, really violent and rough. And we've just been dealing with this for like nine years and this is an answered prayer. I mean, the Holy Ghost worked through Braden and we had nothing to do with last week's testimony he gave. I mean, two years ago on Mother's Day was the first time I called the law on him for being violent and stealing. And then last week was just tears of joy the other way around. So we've just been blessed with these boys. And we might be a little unconventional of a family, but if you bring your kids to church, I do think God will work on them. Thank you. seen that many at one time, so that's truly a blessing. my life. 
morning. The uh, communion meditation this morning is, what's your name? Now that same day, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. That's from Luke 24, 13, 30, and 31. How strange of Luke to leave out one of the names. Luke was the gospel writer who, above all others, wanted to record historical details. He identified the current emperor, governor, and king. He named Zechariah and Elizabeth, Simeon and Anna, Lazarus the beggar, Zacchaeus the publican, even blind Bartimaeus. But oddly, he named only one of the two on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas, and what's his name? But how absolutely predictable of Luke to highlight this story of the risen Lord appearing to two such unknown, almost anonymous travelers to Emmaus. We have no idea who they were or what they knew, thought, or believed about Jesus. We do not know where the road to Emmaus was, or even where Emmaus was, for that matter. For Luke telling the story of these unknowns who knew Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Sorry. Was well, just the point. The Son of God died for us. The crucified Christ rose for us. He did that for nameless, faceless people like us. Jesus came, died, and rose for the what's-their-names of the world so that the simplest of people might recognize him in the simplest of actions in the breaking of the bread. This is the body of the broken for what's-your-name. This is the cup of the new covenant in his blood poured out for what's-your-name. Please pray with me. 
God, thank you for giving Jesus the name that is above every other name so that every anonymous knee, including our own, might bow for him. to present all right Don come you want to come up and present the Bibles to the Quentin and the boys really but couldn't think of their name Again, before you leave, feel free to grab a hold of those young men and welcome them into the body. Uh, one other announcement I do have. Uh, Jake and Kelly Huber, their oldest daughter, Maddie, has graduated from Corey Rawson High School, and uh, they extended an invitation. They sent it to me, and I forgot it for two weeks now. But it's next Sunday, 5 to 8 at their residence. So they wanted to extend an invitation to the entire church. We were part of their lives for quite a while during our youth. So you guys have the time and are free, feel free, you are welcome. So let's please stand as we close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just 
give thanks for today. Today was truly a blessed day. We have increased your territory by three. Father, we just pray that you are with that, that family as they go forward. We also pray that as we leave this building, you give us the strength to be disciples to not all of us have that gift of preaching. Not all of us are evangelists. But I just pray that we have the strength to explain why we come here every Sunday morning. Just be able to give a reason as to why we believe what we believe. We do ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, say it with me, folks. Love God, love people, share Jesus. Have a great day, everybody.